Welcome to week two of Pub 502. Well, we survived the first week, and now we are diving into um, a little more depth when it comes to the differences between public and private employment and management. And today we'll be focusing on some of the differences in those organizations that lead to different outcomes and how the work gets done. Um, this will influence what we do for the rest of the semester. So one of the things we need to talk about today is whether the public-private distinction actually matters or not. So we talked last week just generally public-private distinctions, and we're going to talk a little bit this week about what that means for the work and how it gets done. But we need to confront the question of whether it actually matters at all. And one of the things that people tend to cling to when they talk about the public-private distinction is the fact that public institutions tend to have these overgrown, thorny, um, bureaucracies, you know, think of the term red tape, and that that does not happen in private enterprises. I'm here to tell you that that actually is not the case. If you have worked for a large corporation, um, you know that that's not the case. If you've worked for General Motors, if you've worked for IBM, um, other corporations that have kind of extended life cycles and are large in scale tend to have the same bureaucratic responses that government organizations do. So if size leads to bureaucracy and not the public or privateness of the organization, what does that mean for our study here? Well, I want to talk about points of connection. Okay, because that really matters. The points of connection between public and private enterprises um, is going to be one of our main um, focal points today. And your book chapter does a really good job of, um, in the chap that's the chapter that I posted from Rainey, talking about hybrid forms, functional analogies, complex interrelations, etc. Um, but what we'll be talking about today are points of connection. I'm gonna, we're going to give two main examples um, where these points of connection really do matter in a public-private context and whether um, bureaucracy comes out of that, whether a slowness to move comes out of that, or whether um, the problem was solved because of um, public intervention. So First, and we're going to go over this fairly quickly because your reading does this quite well, is we're going to talk about why public organizations exist. Now, one of the main reasons public organizations exist is pretty self-explanatory, which is political desire. The body politic has decided that this organization should exist, and therefore it comes into existence because government has willed it so. There's also um, these market failure reasons. In other words, that markets fail in either in traditional ways or just in ways that don't serve public interests. And the first of these um, market failure explanations is the tragedy of the commons. Um, the tragedy of the commons is a situation where people hold things in common, but not everybody upkeeps the common property. Um, so I actually posted a chalk talk from the National Science Foundation, um, and I urge you to just watch that. That's a much better explanation than I can give here, and we should not recreate the wheel. But if you are unfamiliar with what the tragedy of the commons means, or you just want a quick refresher on it, I, I highly recommend um, you view that video, because what it comes down to is the fact that the commons are not guarded by market solutions, that um, public solutions are needed to um, guard the commons. Then there's this idea of individual incompetence, and this is not meant in a um, nasty um, per pejorative way, but we are all incompetent at certain things. There are certainly things at which I am incompetent um, because we cannot be experts and um, really superstars in everything, right? I am, I, I, and I don't care to be, good at cooking. I might be good at it, but I just don't like it that much. Um, so the market solution to that is that I eat out more um, than I eat at home. But the market solution to that is that I can buy pre-made food ready to eat. Well, there, the government solution to problems like that varies from problem to problem. And we cannot be competent in everything that the government 
does. So this might mean if I have an ailing parent and I need them to be cared for um, with private duty nursing, is something like Medicare or Medicaid going to pay for that when I cannot and when I cannot provide it myself? Then there is the idea of controlling externalities, negative externalities. Um, negative externalities are the things that spill over in an otherwise private transaction. So for example, right now by watching this you are using power of some sort, whether it's battery power or power directly from the electric socket. Um, and the greatest example of externalities are the negative externalities that come from providing power, the negative externality being pollution. Um, the private uh, exchange is you're paying the power company for the power that you utilize, whether it's on a battery and you already charged it or you're using it in the moment, um, they are providing it but the externality is pollution. How do we control that? There's only so much an economic market can provide. Certainly consumers can band together to take care of things, but if the costs spill over um, and there's no other alternative, there's no other sponsored alternative or control on those things, the problem will continue to mount until it's insurmountable at some point. And this is the basic story of climate change, that there needs to be some sort of um, other mechanism in place, that consumer choice alone will not create a situation in which companies um, necessarily want to do their part to control um, global warming. And then finally, efficiency. Um, and when I say efficiency, people are usually um, not quick to use um, the term efficiency with public organizations. But when you think about it, there are efficiencies that exist. And we can think about the Social Security Administration. The Social Security Administration is able to do its work fairly efficiently because it has the controls of government at its hands, right? That there are some levers it can pull that a private organization cannot in order to gather information on people and disseminate benefits. If we were to outsource that to a private company, we'd have to outsource also some of the public information that the organization keeps. In other words, its connection to government, government makes it um, more efficient rather than less efficient in doing its job. So there are ways in which government organizations um, can provide more efficient benefits. There are three competing definitions of public values given in your um, text. Go ahead and read those. I put a brief blurb about each one here, um, but I'm not going to go through them. There are various um, takes on what a public value is. What I am going to talk about, though, in more depth than I think the reading does, is how we identify what public values are. Um, because what the theories that we have um, do is they say, well, this is a this is how a public value is thought of. Um, but they very rarely give us insight into, okay, well, at the end of the day, how do we say what is and is not a public value? Um, so there are a few suggestions that are given, and I want to talk about what those mean in a little more depth. The first is to just kind of whenever we talk about public values just I just define them as you talk about them and what I mean by that is don't leave it ambiguous um, but instead when you say that there is a public value um, for example in taking care of the elderly um, then just say why there is a public value don't uh, do too much to look into it or find documents that support it just say that that's a public value and the idea is is that if you identify it as a public value then it will become a public value now that's all fine and good but when you're trying to justify your existence as a government um, nonprofit or other type of public organization uh, gets tricky, right? And managers in particular are often constrained, as we'll see over the next few slides here, in what they can do in terms of defining what the role of the organization is. So another way you can do this, and we'll talk about this as we go through the stakeholder identification and strategic planning um, processes in this class, is pull the public or groups of the public 
In other words, if you want to find out what public values are, go to the public that defines those values and find out what they actually hold um, to be true in terms of public values, what government should be providing, what nonprofits should be doing, what the role of these things are in our society. Now, there are, of course, pros and cons of doing this. The pros of doing this is that if you you know, come up with a set of things that the public values, and those generally can be read to support your existence as an organization or an entity, then you're good to go, right? But if they don't, does that mean you just close down what you're doing? And is the public always right? Um, let's leave politics aside for a minute. Um, and let's just think of all of these random um, public competitions that we've had over the years. Um, you know, think about American Idol back in its heyday and who won American Idol. Was the public always right? In fact, there used to be a bit of a controversy about American Idol because the results often tended, are, are often tended to be uh, quite white um, and upper middle class. Um, dominated. They also tended to have um, these things, especially after the advent of social media, where they would try and promote um, a, a contestant that wasn't really worth promoting as a joke. So the public or groups of the public might not always um, actually reflect what a public value truly is, because they might have ulterior motives. So then, what the research has done is tried to develop what they call an inventory of public values. And what they have come up with are seven major value constellation or constellations or categories. And we don't necessarily need to go over each one, but how they do that I think is important, the process by which that is done. So instead of just jumping right in or going to the public, there is a way in which you can consult the literature, which either has gone to the public or has looked at what has been enacted over time or historical um, elements of, of prior cases. And you can develop an inventory of what has been listed as a public value in the past. And what researchers have done is to organize these into major value constellations. In a way, you can kind of think of this like you think of your own personal political ideology, that certainly you have issue orientations where you think, you know, we should have single payer, we shouldn't have single payer health care. But that's usually part of a broader constellation of values about how you value and see the role of government. And that's what researchers have done, is that they've developed these inventories from previously conducted research, from some public input, and from elsewhere to create uh, value constellations or categories. The reason why this matters is, is this is going to become integral to your job as a public manager to justify your organization and also to tap into the public needs. So one of the other things I wanted to do is kind of reformulate, um, I think it was actually table 3.1, but it might be exhibit 3.1 from the Rainey chapter. And these are distinctive characteristics of public management and public orgs. So I wanted to talk about these categories, and I'm going to use my little pointer here so I hope you can see it. Um, and I wanted to talk about them very, very briefly and what results. You have these three categories, environmental factors, organization environmental factors, and organizational role structures and processes. And what this um, kind of gathering is supposed to give to you is the ways in which public management and public organizations and public employment are constrained in unique ways. And so there are environmental things, the fact that these organizations and the people within them are um, constrained legally in certain ways that private entities might not have to deal with, that they have political constraints, direct political constraints that a company like General Motors might not have to deal with. Organizational or environmental, uh, organization environmental factors, in other words, the organization and environment plays off of each other to create these factors. Um, that there are unique expectations of fairness when you're dealing with a public organization that do not exist when you're dealing with a private one. 
um, that you have significant externalities that the market can't handle or do away with. So as you move from environmental factors to organization environmental factors, and finally to organization, organizational roles, structures, and processes, what you're doing is you're moving from kind of the giant universe to the interplay between public and private, and then finally within the, the, the public entities themselves, what are the constraints on employment, management, and so forth. So this chart will be helpful as we go through um, the next few weeks talking about these constraints, talking about how incentives might not be possible in certain um, instances. The one thing I want to caution you about is people tend to think this means that innovation just does not exist in the public realm. And I'm here to tell you that that's not true. We're actually going to spend a whole week talking about how that's not true, but how it's different and how there are different expectations and it should be different expectations. And we even have an example today uh, to show that public organizations can, in fact, be innovative. The idea of this um, chart here is to show you the overlap between ownership and funding. Um, People tend not to realize, for example, that the U.S. Postal Service does not receive government funding, that what it receives is funding from its own sales. Um, so we have to think about these things when we're thinking about what the incentive structures can be, but yet what the political calculations are in running, managing, and even working at these organizations. That if we're dealing with private funding, but public ownership, those are pretty tight constraints because you have private funding coming in that you have to contend with those shareholders and stakeholders, but you have public ownership, so you have some sort of public role to play. So the first example that I want to talk about is the EpiPen price controversy. EpiPen is owned by Mylan, which is a for-profit corporation, um, a pharmaceutical company, um, that produces many medicines, but among them the EpiPen injector or auto injector of epinephrine. Epinephrine is um, one of the kind of hallmark drugs if you are having an allergic reaction to something, especially one that might lead to anaphylaxis. And what had happened, if you watch the video, this is very clear, but a kind of 30-second overview, what had happened was is that Mylan um, announced that they purchased Merrick's um, generic competitor. Um, so they have effectively gained a monopoly on the system because not only did they purchase the EpiPen and there aren't any generic competitors, but the one competitor that there was called AviQ um, was no longer um, a viable alternative because there were um, design flaws that led it to inject the wrong amount into people. What ended up being under patent then um, was not the medicine itself. Epinephrine is generically available, but is the delivery method. Because otherwise you have to actually find the dose in a syringe and vial and then inject it into someone. And when someone's having an allergic reaction, time matters significantly. Well, because they had um, the only available auto injector epinephrine pen, um, and because they are a company that maximizes value for its shareholders, um, meaning gets them money, they started to raise the price of the EpiPen um, pretty significantly, um, to the point at which I believe there was a 400% increase in the price of the EpiPen. Um, people were were kind of used to a copay and were coming in and being told they had to pay hundreds of dollars for an EpiPen. Um, why did this happen? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that the company owned it. Um, they had kind of unique control over it um, and therefore they used that to their advantage. The bigger issue here is the fact that not only was the EpiPen the only auto delivery device on the market, but that in the mix of all of this, between the point at which um, Mylan gained um, the control over the EpiPen and the competitors kind of fell by the wayside, there was a concerted effort by the company 
Um, by the way, the CEO is up there in the right-hand corner. She is the daughter of a senator from West Virginia. That is Joe Manchin's daughter. Um, and her and her mother actually worked to increase EpiPen accessibility in schools, which sounds like a great thing, right? There are a lot of children with allergies in schools. Um, staff should be knowledgeable about how to use EpiPens. Um, and they should have them on hand in case of anaphylactic shock. Sounds fantastic. Except when you drive up the demand, you also drive up the price. And so people who needed it on an individual basis could not compete. Um, and there was an overall shortage in EpiPens, which drove up the price even further. So you have people who cannot get a hold of EpiPens, even though they have life-threatening um, allergies and need, them, need to have them on hand in case of accidental exposure, um, driven in part by a public-private partnership to increase awareness about food allergies. And what happened, if you've watched the video that I posted, and you should, whether you've done it before or after this, um, is that there was a concerted effort by Congress to try and rein in what the company was doing. Now, what they ended up doing, um, and I think this is still in effect, is this um, access program situation here. Um, although there are, there are a couple of caveats to this. One that they ended up doing is coming up with a system by which you would pay less with what is called a savings card that would cover your copay up to a certain amount. In addition now, there have been um, increased competitors in the marketplace um, that were supported in part by um, government intervention into this. Um, to actually go ahead and try and make something that is competitive to the EpiPen delivery auto injector. Because that's really the, the key issue here is that nothing else was um, a sufficient delivery method. So why are we talking about this? Well, we have um, a situation where we have a private company, but its impact on public life becomes huge because we have a lack of access. We have at the same time a competing access program for places like public schools to have EpiPens. So we have the intervention of public policy with a profit motivation. We kind of have all of these things that are coming together that are not just private. This is not a private company with just private pressures. This is a private company that at multiple points in time, sometimes to benefit them and sometimes to their detriment, had significant public pressure because of the public values associated with what they were doing here. We believe that companies in the United States, generally speaking, as a public value, should be able to make a profit, but we don't believe they should be able to make a profit at a certain, um, to, the, to take advantage of certain people to make that profit. And the EpiPen controversy kind of tapped into that. When do we feel like enough is enough with these um, pharmaceutical companies, especially those that hold a patent or a design patent or just an effective monopoly over the delivery of um, a, an effective, safe, and very important medication and delivery method. So public-private distinction doesn't necessarily work here. Our public values came into play even though we're talking about a private company. So private companies aren't exempt from public values, but certainly uh, Mylan had a different set of responses than a public organization might have. And what you see happen is public organizations like Congress, like other entities, have to kind of step up their own game to enforce public values on a private entity. So another mini case study and a way in which you can get involved, actually. Um, one of the things that the Michigan Economic Development Corporation has tried to do is to support local projects in new and innovative ways. And um, if you've ever chipped in on a Kickstarter or GoFundMe or um, Indiegogo or anything like that, um, this is much the case of patronicity. It's a crowdfunding website 
that does a couple of things. Um, first, it raises money for public projects um, and gets people on board as stakeholders financially and um, sort of um, uh, just by name involved in the project. But also by its crowd, crowdfunding mechanism, not only is it raising funds, but it's allowing the government to see where there is public interest and to direct money where there is interest. So what patronicity does and how Michigan uses it, the MADC uses it, is to find projects and fund projects that are publicly supported. So it sets a goal, a fundraising goal, that could be ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, and the MEDC pledges to match that if the project is able to raise that money in a certain period of time. This is an example of innovation. Now, certainly crowdfunding is kind of what we typically associate with private markets, right? That you have kind of your new Shark Tank project and you're going to crowdfund it in order to get the funds to mass produce it. But crowdfunding is in some ways government 101, right? We're pooling money together to make an outcome happen that the public wants to see happen. Um, now, the reason why I say there's an opportunity for you to get involved and a good way to see this um, in um, action is that there's a project going on in Flint right now that is up on patronicity that, that the MEDC um, has provided a challenge grant for. So if they can raise money um, by the due date, they can get the matching funds from the MEDC, and that is the free mural competition through the Flint Public Art Project. For those of you unaware, the Flint Public Art Project has been bringing in international artists and local artists to create these murals all around Flint. And in fact, in October, there's going to be, I believe it's October, um, a tour that you can take to see all these murals. There's over 50 murals so far. And as you can see, they're absolutely astounding works of art. Um, the Flint Public Art Project is trying to bring more mural makers together and to try and make Flint kind of the hub for mural art um, in Michigan, certainly in a hub for mural art um, internationally. So they have set up their challenge grant. MEDC has granted them um, the challenge grant and they are trying to raise funds for it. I um, will link this for you and you can go ahead and check it out. Um, another reason why this is a great thing to help out. Not only is it Flint, not only is it public art, not only is it kind of, you should flip through the pictures on Facebook um, for the Flint Public Art Project. These murals are just amazing. Like this one just looks very real, looks like a photo and it's painting, but there's some that are kind of surrealistic. There are some that are more pop art. They're just amazing. Um, but the executive director of the Flint Public Art Project is a graduate of this program. So there is an actual connection here. Um, someone who had to take Pub 502 in the past um, actually is helping to organize some of this. So there's a lot of public good going on here. Now back to the reason why I am using it here. Public innovation can happen. It doesn't happen in a bubble. Sure, it can play off of private sector um, innovation as well, but it happens and it can happen to create things that would not otherwise exist. Public art can be provided by corporate sponsors. That, there is no doubt. But public art that resonates with a people that draws in not just um, international and national artists, but also connects them with local artists and they've held workshops and get togethers and things like that. There's a kind of cross learning that happens that is certainly a public value um, that would be hard to pull people about, right? But it exists and it's doing a lot of great work. It's bringing a lot of attention to Flint um, that is positive, which is certainly needed after the water crisis. Um, and is doing some really awesome work um, and showing kind of a new side to Flint um, than what we've seen in the past. So I highly encourage you to check it out. They have a video up on their patronicity site. I'll link all of that. But I also want you to think about this as a way in which public organizations, whether you're talking about the Flint Public Art Project, which is a nonprofit, or the MEDC, which is a governmental entity, in which they can develop new ways in which to fulfill public values um, on an ongoing basis.
All right, main takeaways. The first is that public-private distinctions can be difficult to ascertain and may sometimes be less meaningful than first thought. Um, and I, I don't mean this to be glib because we'll come back around to the fact that there are constraints on public organizations in a minute. But when we think about the EpiPen example, that is something where a public-private distinction has some gray areas, right? When you are um, a monopoly over this kind of life-saving, in-the-moment life-saving device, um, you have different responsibilities to the public, or at least so says Congress. Public values are hard to nail down, and public managers are often tasked with doing this. If you were to ask the people of Flint whether the public mural project is a top concern of theirs, I'm sure people of Flint are going to say no. So polling is not going to help. But there are pockets of money out there that are available for this type of project that aren't available for other types of projects. And public art has been shown to have multitudes of great effects on public um, sentiment, public values, and even public service delivery. So at the end of the day, whether something serves a public value or not is a tricky question. Managing public values is, is work is tricky. God, I, I kind of jumped the shark on myself there. Um, and there are di different incentives at play and different constraints um, with public work versus private work. And finally, success and innovation can be had in the public sector. We're going to get into this a lot later in the semester. Um, but as we talked about kind of in that refined chart 3.1, inefficiencies and negative consequences can happen in the private sector, but they can also happen in the public sector too. And they usually happen for different reasons, right? The failures in the public sector are usually because of public value mismatch um, and whether that means just not funding the good things or funding the bad things. But private sector failures are usually market failures and different than the public sector ones we talk about. So as public sector managers, the importance is to understand the role that these things play and that it's not a clear, bright line difference between these types of organizations all the time. So this week, as kind of a reminder to things, uh, let's check in on a few things. One, reading quiz two. Um, and the second, most of you have already done this, the book selection form. This is due by Sunday, the earlier the better. Um, if you have not done that, go ahead and submit your choice for the book. That way I can post them and everybody can get going. That is all I have for this week. We will talk more next week.